production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream Public Media are made possible by PNC and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland, where we're devoted to conversations of consequence that help uh, democracy thrive. It's Friday, March 4th, and I'm Eric Fiala, Head of Corporate Responsibility at Key Bank and City Club Board Member. I'm happy to welcome all of you here today for the Cyrus Eaton Memorial Forum featuring Chris Kuhar, Executive Director of the Cleveland Metro Park Zoo. The recent birth of a baby gorilla at the Cleveland Metro Park Zoo the first in their 139 year history, has focused the community's attention on the Western lowland gorilla, a critically endangered species. The zoo has also used this as an opportunity to raise awareness on the conservation work they do around the globe, and specifically with gorilla populations in Africa. The future of zoos in America is growing around wildlife conservation and they are doubling down on goals that provide visitors the opportunity to encounter the natural world. With a complicated historical legacy and a commitment to ecological stewardship, zoo leaders have their work cut out for them in the 21st century. At the Cleveland Metro Park Zoo, leaders are learning how to do this through their work with primates. Executive Director of the Cleveland Metro Park Zoo since 2012, Chris Kuhar has developed uh, and devoted a great deal of his career to work with primates. Chris previously served four years at the zoo's curator, uh, as the zoo's curator of primates and small mammals and as a research manager at Walt Disney World's Animal Kingdom Park in Florida. Kuhar has also served as chair of the board for the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. If you have questions for Chris, you can text them to 330-541-5794. That's 330-541-5794. You can also tweet them at the City Club and we'll try to work them in. Members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming Chris Kuhar. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna start with a confession. When you talk to people who work in zoos and aquariums, when you talk to my colleagues, uh, I feel like they all knew that they were gonna work in zoos from a very early age, right? They, they all seem to have some sort of cool superhero origin story. I don't have one of those. And I'm not sure why, it used to bother me. I used to try and figure out, well, why, why didn't I know that, right? And until I came across a quote by Rick Ridgway, uh, Rick is a, a mountaineer, an adventurer, he's the uh, VP of Environmental Affairs at Patagonia, which is a company I greatly admire. And the quote is, the best journeys in life are those that answer questions you never thought to ask. I like that quote partly because it relieves me of a little bit of responsibility for not having a better career path, uh, partly because I think it truly defines what my career path is, partly because I think it helps define what the evolution of zoos has been. I didn't really know much about zoos until I was an undergraduate biology student at the University of Akron. I never really thought about zoos. I kind of stumbled into it, to be honest. Uh, my first paid zoo job was actually at Cleveland Metro Park Zoo in the, in the mid-1990s doing behavioral data collection. And I had the opportunity to participate in a multi-zoo research study um, that was focused on gorilla behavior. And it was led by two graduate students at Georgia Tech, Kristen Lucas and Tara Stowinski. Now, before I get into what that project really was, um, I think it's probably time to, to just talk a little bit about what breeding systems, because when you go to a zoo and you look at the exhibit or you see a press release about animals, often people don't think about what, that, what goes into that. And um, there's, it's not as simple as when a mommy gorilla loves a daddy gorilla, you end up with baby gorillas, right? Most reproduction that occurs in the animal kingdom is not out of a monogamous pair. It's everything from animals not even having contact together to coming together just to breeding, 
when you're talking about primates, the, the breeding systems can get really complicated. And as a result, you tend to have social groups that aren't necessarily breeding in nature. Gorillas are one of those species. Gorillas form all male groups. And depending on the subspecies of the gorilla and the particular habitat type, those, those groups can be transient, where males come in and out for a short period of time, or they can stay together longer. Often these are males who get kicked out of their family group by dad because they're big enough to be reproductively viable and dad doesn't want them around anymore, but they're not big enough and strong enough to maintain their, their own social group. So those boys then hang around with each other. They play, they fight, they eat, they sleep, repeat, until they find a girl. It's sort of like college, I guess. <laughs> but these bachelor gorilla groups work really well in the wild, in contiguous habitats where animals can move in and out, move in and out of groups. In zoos, we recognize that that's a natural history. That's what these animals do, but it's a little bit harder. This original project that we were working on was an attempt to, to document what was happening in these fledgling bachelor gorilla groups that were being formed in the 1990s. What were the components to them? And the idea then was to take the information that we learned and apply that, give that information back to the Gorilla Species Survival Program. We refer to them as SSPs. This is a subcommittee within the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. It operates at the species level, and this group helps make decisions about what animals breed, which animals move to different zoos, and what the situations and husbandry recommendations are for that species. Now, Cleveland had an all-male group. So Kristen Lucas actually came up to Cleveland to train us on how to collect data on, on this project, and it was the first time I met Kristen. And I learned a lot from Kristen. I learned more from the gorillas. And one gorilla in particular, there was this eight-year-old male named Makolo. Makolo was the youngest male in this bachelor group, and he was what can only be described as punky. Uh, to give you a little bit of frame of reference, if you know a young male, say 13 to 16 years of age, who has the uncanny ability of pushing buttons and getting everybody riled up, and then somehow extracting himself from the situation so he's not part of the drama and he doesn't get the impact of that. I see some nodding heads. Perhaps you have one of those in your household. Um, that's Makolo, okay? So I learned a couple of things from this process. The, the first is that is really smart. I wish I had half of his political savvy. The second is that gorilla behavior is complex and it's subtle. Unlike chimpanzee behavior, which is where I started my career, gorillas are much more calm. And let's be honest, when you look at a gorilla, they look bored. They look like they'd be, rather be anywhere else than where they're at. But the reality is, is that they're, they're detecting very subtle behavior cues. Posture, positioning, facial expressions. And what they're doing all the time is monitoring where everyone else is. It's like a chess match in a zoo exhibit every day where these males are moving around and trying to get the drop on us. It's, it's basically an episode of Game of Thrones every day with less bloodshed and less nudity. <laughs> so what I realized was this is really interesting, right? How did I not know about this? But I knew that I wanted to, to have a career in this. But it was really unclear why, why didn't we all know how interesting this was? Because if you went to zoos in the 70s and 80s, this wasn't apparent, right? Well, when you look at the history of zoos, in, in the 1980s, the late E.O. Wilson and Stephen Keller came out with a concept called biophilia. And this is the idea that humans have this want or need to be connected to animals, to the environment. They have this inherent draw to nature. And honestly, that's what zoos were in the post-industrial age. In a time where people were moving to cities which were dirty and polluted and loud, they wanted a connection to a pastoral life that they lost. That's what zoos were. That's what zoos represented for the greater part of the 1900s. That changed a little bit in the 1970s. And I tell my environmental colleagues that the spark of the environmental revolution, pun intended, came from the Cuyahoga River fire in 1969. Now, I feel like as a native Northeast Ohio, and I have to sort of digress for a second and talk a little bit about the Cuyahoga River Fire. Because it wasn't the Cuyahoga River Fire, it was the 12th Cuyahoga River Fire, okay? And the important part for us Clevelanders and our pride is that it was not the only river that caught fire. Rivers in Buffalo, Detroit, Chicago, Baltimore, Philly, they all caught fire. Basically, if your river didn't catch fire in the 1900s, it was because your town was too small. You didn't have enough industry. 
And that sounds like a weird brag. It's not how I intend it. The point is, is that this is what the culture was. This is what we were doing to the environment. And Cleveland should actually be credited, instead of the fire, should be credited with the work that Carl Stokes and Louis Stokes and the city of Cleveland did to raise awareness about what was happening to the river, and more importantly, what was happening to the people that were being impacted by that environment. In the 70s, the world started to change, and zoos had to change with it. In the 70s, the zoos first started to look at accreditation. The first accreditation was created. In the 80s, it became mandatory to be accredited in order to be a member of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, or what would become AZA. Cleveland Metro Park Zoo has been continuously accredited since the 80s. What accreditation does is create this increasing standard. Here we are 40 years later, the standards continue to increase each and every year. So by increasing the, the performance of an individual institution, you can increase the performance of the profession. Zoos also had to figure out what they were beyond a place to connect with animals, right? If you know anything about zoos other than them as an entertainment destination, you probably are familiar with zoos as an education destination. In the 70s, one of the things that we established is ourselves as a science education location. Today, over 100,000 school kids participate in an education program at Cleveland Metro Park Zoo. Every fifth grader in Cleveland Metropolitan School District participates in an ed education program at Cleveland Metro Park Zoo. We decided that this was going to be something that we would do to benefit the community. But there were other changes that you all and I was not aware of that were happening in the 70s and 80s. Because it was no longer ethical and perhaps not even legal anymore to go grab an animal from the wild and put it in your zoo, you had to think differently about your business model. You had to figure out how you're going to keep those animals alive longer and how you're going to reproduce them and how are you going to emphasize care and welfare. So suddenly, science and conservation became more important. I eventually enrolled in that graduate program that Tara and Kristen came out of, that graduate program at Georgia Tech. Uh, Kristen at the time got her PhD. She moved on to be a primate curator at the Lincoln Park Zoo. Tara was still there. She kind of became my big sister uh, research advisor and was working with the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund. By the time I got there, the Zoo Atlanta Georgia Tech program was the premier place where scientists were being trained to go out into the world. As a matter of fact, zoo directors at the Denver Zoo, Detroit, Disney, New Orleans, Santa Barbara, Phoenix, Chicago, Cleveland, all came out of that program. And three of the past Association of Zoos and Aquariums chairs of the board spent time there, including myself. But when I got there, I was training grad students. And I actually came back to Cleveland to train the next generation of students on how to collect data on these evolving projects. McCullough was still there, and he was still punky. But he wasn't eight anymore. He was bigger. He was basically a full-grown, 300-pound adult male gorilla. So punky is probably, probably not the right word. It's probably more like a bully. Okay? But that's not his fault. That's what happens to young adult male gorillas. They grow into themselves. They display. They posture. That's part of the natural history. So Makolo was evolving, but so was our profession. We started looking at subdisciplines because we started as basically an ethological exercise, right? The project that I started with Kristen and Tara was similar to the things you see with Jane Goodall or Diane Fossey sitting in the forest and writing down what they see, right? It's documenting it and it's creating a narrative. That's not the typical experimental research that you think of when you think of science, but it has an important role. It's what we were basing the decisions we were making about animals, and we were comparing the behavior patterns of our animals to those animals in the wild. But like any good science program, what we determined was that we had more questions than we had answers. Every time we answered a question, we had three more questions pop up. So we started to look at utilizing other subdisciplines of biology. Personality. Could you predict an animal's behavior based on their personality type? What are the environmental effects of light, noise, physical barriers. We started to bring in endocrinology and look at what was going on inside the animal. We looked at epidemiology, so not just the health of that particular animal in front of you, but the health of the entire population. We identified heart disease. Fibrosis and cardiomyopathy is a common cause of death in gorillas. It's similar to, but not exactly the same thing as the heart disease we see in humans. So we started looking more deeply at diet and nutrition and exercise. 
And what happened now is all of that research is feeding into the Gorilla SSP to allow the SSP to make science-based decisions on how to manage those animals. But maybe more importantly, we really started to blur the lines within the zoo as to what was research, what was husbandry, and what was veterinary care. The animal care teams are now training animals like a full-grown silverback gorilla in Makolo to voluntarily put their arm out and get a blood draw. Training animals to voluntarily allow a cardiac ultrasound to occur. To voluntarily provide a saliva sample, as well as a bunch of other samples that I won't mention because you guys are all eating lunch. <laughs> we've blurred the line, and we've created a much better integration of science and animal care. But from the exterior, you might not have noticed it. We didn't really talk about it. All of that husbandry training had to go on behind the scenes. But in addition to that, we're developing other forms of research. We started looking at the impact that animal behavior had on our guests. We looked at when you, an animal is active and performs normal behavior patterns, it actually increases guest stay times. It increases guest satisfaction, which as a business person, you can identify that that probably has financial implications to the organization. But more importantly, when those animals were performing natural and normal behavior patterns, guests were more receptive to the education messaging and the conservation messaging that we were providing. We started looking at conservation in general. Were we meeting our goals? When I spent my time at Disney's Animal Kingdom, we were evaluating conservation education programs in the wild, and we were using fundamental psychological research techniques on these programs. And what we heard over and over again from all of these programs in the wild was that, yeah, the biological research tools were important, but the connection, what made conservation programs most effective was people and the connections that were made with people. So that's why conservation programs often do things which would be traditionally considered socioeconomic. Drill a borehole for water access, build a clinic, build a school, provide educational opportunities. There's a connection between the people and the animal. So if people are tied to conservation, what's the role of the modern zoo? Well, in 2016, Tara Stowinski became the CEO of the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund. Kristen Lucas is the Director of Conservation and Science at Cleveland Metro Park Zoo. She's a board member for the Fossey Fund, as well as the chair of the Gorilla Species Survival Plan. Me, I'm just the director of the Cleveland Metro Park Zoo. But what happened was we began to grow our programs. We began to grow the connection with the Fossey Fund. We were in Rwanda training the next generation of conservation professionals. Remember, Rwanda is a country that went through a genocide in the 90s. Basically, a generation of scientific knowledge was wiped away. What we were doing was training that next generation of scientists, and we weren't doing it in the old colonialism version of conservation. We weren't there making decisions. We were providing support for that next generation so that they could make, gener make decisions for their country and for their community. In one of those trips out there to do those trainings, I had the opportunity to carry gear over for the trackers for the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund. The trackers are the folks that go out and monitor those gorilla populations 365 days a year. And we were there handing out rain gear and cold weather gear. And it was like sort of like a, a wedding receiving line where we were handing out gear and shaking hands and we were thanking the trackers as they came through. And one elderly tracker came up and he shook my hand and as I turned to pivot to shake hands with the next person in line, he didn't let go. And he put his second hand on me. And I know when you're getting the double hand handshake, it's time to pay attention, right? So I turned to the gentleman and I looked at him and he stared me in the eye for a second. And then he said in his heavily accented English, use your zoo to tell people what we're doing. Tell people why it matters. Now, I'm not sure how long the next person in line had to wait for me to sort of come back to reality after that interaction. The gentleman I would later find out, his name was Jonas. He had been a tracker with the Fossey Fund for nearly 40 years. He was speaking to me in English, which was probably his fifth language. He didn't have more than a secondary education. As a matter of fact, he didn't complete secondary school. And his experience with zoos was only with the knowledge that we were providing funding to support the program and with tourists who came to trek for gorillas in Rwanda. And he identified that zoos could be a powerful player in conservation. So now, in addition to blurring the lines around husbandry, we're starting to blur the lines between the guest experience, 
education, and conservation. In 2016, we rebranded the zoo. New logo, new mindset, new tagline, securing a future for wildlife. Because we didn't think enough people understood that we were doing conservation work on a global scale. Now, we didn't sacrifice the entertainment piece, and I want to emphasize that. We still created Asian Lantern Festival and Wild Winter Lights. We installed a zip line. The point here is that you don't have to choose education or entertainment. You don't have to choose mission or vision. Zoos provide a unique opportunity to blend the two things. And it's important because these issues aren't going away. This isn't a forced narrative. In 2019, a UN report was released that over a million species are threatened with extinction worldwide. Now, it's easy to find that number overwhelming or to say, you know, I don't care what the left-handed three-stripe wombat does. Just for the record, that's not a real species. I made that up. <laughs> but it's easy to take the name of a species you've never heard of and dismiss it as not being important, okay? But every species we lose on this planet is a food source for another animal or preys upon another animal to keep that population in check. Every plant species we lose keeps soil stable, prevents erosion, provides oxygen or transpiration, or feeds an animal species. Every time we lose a species, this interwoven web of life that's on our planet breaks a little bit. Every time we lose a species, we get closer to a zoonotic disease. Now, many of you got a crash course in zoonotic diseases with COVID-19. We've been monitoring coronaviruses for years, Middle East respiratory system, SARS, been monitoring diseases like highly pathogenic avian influenza, you know it as bird flu, right? We've been paying attention to them because they're tied closely to conservation. There's a new strain of bird flu in the eastern United States right now. And while it's not transmissible to humans in the same way that COVID is, it can wipe out entire poultry flocks, okay? That's here and it's real. Birds that pollinate and, and provide seed dispersion for our forests Bees that fertilize our crops are collapsing, hive collapse. It's easy to, to not think about water security when you live next to the Great Lakes, but the reality is the majority of the world lives with water insecurity issues, without access to fresh water long term. There's flooding, there's fires. These environmental issues don't care who you voted for in the last election, and it doesn't matter whether you think that these issues are human caused or not, they're real. We have to act on them. We have to make decisions. We have to have conversations about them. Maybe Jonas was right. Maybe you can use a zoo to do that. But how? Let's go back to Mokolo for a second. In 2017, BBAC, the last member of Mokolo's bachelor group, passed away, leaving Mokolo alone. So we had a decision to make. And with the recommendation of the Gorilla SSP, we decided to put Mokolo into a breeding situation. Now, mind you, Makola hadn't seen a female since he left his mom at about the age of six. So we didn't know what Makola would do. When we brought the girls in, we watched closely, and that bully of a gorilla ran scared from those females when they <laughs> arrived. But he'd eventually find himself, he'd grow confident, and he turned into the silverback that he needed to be. Settle disputes, keep the groom calm, but not be too aggressive. Okay, step one. Well, what happens when we remove the contraception from one of the females? Will Mokolo know what to do? A month after removing the contraception, we got a positive pregnancy test. He could get the job done. So now, here's the scary part. What happens when there's a baby in the group? Would Mokolo be overtly aggressive? What happens to the females? Would they take care of him? So the team began an extensive training where they would use a stuffed animal to bring the stuffed animal to the mesh, where all the group members were trained to pick up the stuffed animal and bring it to the mesh in hopes that if we needed a surrogate, one of those females would respond and be able to bring the, the baby forward so the animal care team could feed it. We estimated a birth window of middle of December to the middle of January. And because the gorillas did not read the birth pan, the baby was born at the end of October. And our worst, our worst case scenario, like the, like the fire alarm going off. Keep going? All right. 
We're just going to pretend that doesn't happen. So um, I just completely lost my train of thought. OK, so um, what we realized was that the mom didn't take care of the baby gorilla. So we had to reintroduce this baby gorilla to one of the other group members. So the first step is, what's Makolo going to do? When Makolo comes into that space, he walked in, he sniffed the baby, he touched it, and then he stepped aside as though to say, all right, ladies, let's get this done. <laughs> Frederica, a 46-year-old female, walked in and almost immediately scooped up that baby gorilla and has been carrying him ever since. She brings him to the mesh every two hours so that that baby can get fed through a rigged piece of tubing connected to a syringe, to a, to a nipple, so that baby can nurse through a barrier, because my staff is staying safely on the side of, of the barrier. And Makolo allows that to happen. Sure, he gets some extra treats along the way, but he's been the right silverback. When the baby had to go out of the group to be treated for pneumonia, Makolo responded like a true father. He began contact calling, his heart rate was elevated. Yes, we check his heart rate every day. He was agitated until 10 days later when we were able to bring the baby back. His heart rate came down and he relaxed. The baby was back. It still blows my mind when I think of that punky male when he's playing with the feet of the baby gorilla as it's being, it's being fed. It's hard to believe it's the same male. This summer, the, the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund will open the Ellen DeGeneres campus. Okay. This is a new opportunity for the Fossey Fund that they expect will double the number of tourists who actually go to, to hear more about gorilla conservation. Those visitors will be greeted by the Cleveland Metro Park Zoo Interpretive Trail, a generous donation from Jim and Linda Francis, and an opportunity that shows how our zoo is committed to gorilla conservation. We continue to educate students here and abroad. This year, we have the first baby gorilla at Cleveland Metro Park Zoo in 140 years. That baby has generated one million video views in four months. It has generated 330 independent news stories locally, nationally, and globally. The missing ingredient in that story is a gorilla facility. Our gorillas are in a facility that was built in the 80s. And let's be honest, it looks like it. All the husbandry that I talked about occurs behind the scenes, but we're working on it. We're in the process of reimagining a facility where gorillas have great space year round, where we can incorporate all of the research that we've developed for the past 20 years, incorporate concepts like visual barriers, edges, access to ultraviolet light. We can bring the husbandry to the front of the house where we can show all guests blood training, cardiac ultrasound training. It doesn't have to be behind the scenes. We're in the process of designing the best gorilla facility in the world. And that means it's a facility that not only focuses on the animals, but on guest experience, education, conservation, and economic impact to the city of Cleveland. You're going to have to stay tuned to hear more about that one. People ask me all the time about the future of zoos and whether our zoos are still relevant today. They are still relevant, I promise you, but we don't know why the fire alarm's going off and it's unsafe to keep everybody here right now. So, um, Chris, we're going to welcome you back another time. Um, and with apologies to our listeners on WCPN, um, we're just going to shut this down right now because the fire alarm, there's just too many questions and not enough answers. We'll welcome you back all. When Chris comes back to finish this and do the Q&A, it'll be amazing. Um, but could everybody give him a round of applause on your way out? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, and thanks again, all of you. Thanks to LMM for their, uh, for their work today. Thanks to everybody for your support. I apologize. This is one of those things. Thank you. This is the City Club. Oh, our forum's adjourned. <laughs> for information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org.
production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream Public Media are made possible by PNC and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.